It's a song from Don Quixote states, they were willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause. Make no mistake, these people fought not to destroy, but to defend what they believed. Think for a moment if people like Benny had not gone forth during World War II to protect us. Where would our world be today if the Third Reich was allowed to espouse its form of tyranny in this world, this form of evil? The rest of us owe you and those that fought with you our undying praise to defend us from the evil of this world. During war, people do things that are hellish to survive. Many live with that hell as a memory, and some ask the question, if what they did during war will bar them from the gates of heaven. I can say two things to that. One, we have many examples of warriors that went to war, and when they returned, retired their weapons and lived holy lives. Francis of Assisi, Ignatius of Loyola, Martin of Tours, and then one Roman soldier, Longinius, who pierced the side of Christ and later went on to live a holy life. We have a reading in scripture as well. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. And I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love. Because of the way that Jesus has embraced us. I think that President Lincoln said it best in the Gettysburg Address. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world was, will little note, nor long remember what we say here, and it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. And from those honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave their last full measure of devotion. That we were highly resolved that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from this earth. Because of your efforts in World War II, you too have hallowed the grounds in Europe and our United States of America and your God. Can all please extend your hand in blessing. We call upon St. Michael the Archangel to offer blessing upon this medal and this man as a commemoration of Benny Ochega's service during World War II. We are thankful that Benny not only served, but has brought new life to this world through his children and grandchildren and possibly great-grandchildren. Through his work, through his participation as a citizen of the United States of America and as a faithful servant of the church, we ask this blessing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, 
we now have a flag presentation by my cousin, Todd Archigoff. I promise I wouldn't talk about our child when you're here with him. A lot of things you talk about. Today, I am proud to be able to present to my grandfather this flag from the office of Senator Al Franken. This is a certified that this accompanying flag was flown over the United States Capitol of America in honor of Benny Archiga to celebrate his 89th birthday and to recognize your service in World War II. so that you can be recognized as well. If you've served in our military, I want you to be recognized now. There's nothing that we can do to repay you. Thank you. Grandpa, over here. <laughs> For the last two months, my family has not seen me. I've been working on something, and it's my birthday card to you. Uh, I think you're going to like it. Grandpa, up on that wall, we're going to play you a movie. Folks, it's about 22 minutes long. Bear with it, but I think you'll find it uh, hopefully entertaining. World War II, the most titanic conflict in history. Seventy years ago, on September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland without warning, sparking the start of World War II. By the evening of September 3rd, Britain and France were at war with Germany, and within a week, Australia and New World War II involved every major world power in a war for global domination, and at its end, more than 60 million people had lost their lives in most of Europe and large parts of Asia laid in ruins. Great. 
with depression. And I can uh, work so hard in order to get on our feet and then pay a bill for the war and, uh, and make go of it. The year is 1921. The First World War was over. Prohibition in the United States was enacted and well underway. Speakeasies pop up all over the country, allowing citizens to wet their whistles. Coco Chanel introduces Chanel No. 5 perfume, which would become the world's most legendary fragrance. In Atlantic City, New Jersey, the first Miss America pageant is held, crowning a 16-year-old, the first Miss America. Albert Einstein receives the Nobel Prize in physics. Eskimo pies, table tennis, band-aids, and even healing balloons were all invented. The first baseball game ever broadcast over the radio happens between the Philadelphia Phillies and the Pittsburgh Pirates. The Tomb of the Unknowns is dedicated by President Harding in Arlington National Cemetery. And in what would later become the start to the biggest conflict our world had ever seen, Adolf Hitler becomes chairman of the Nazi party and his rise to power and prominence in Germany. In the same year that Hitler came to rule, a man was born that would soon be asked to join in the fight to end his reign of power, Benny Archibald. In 1940, President Franklin Roosevelt signed into law the Selective Training and Service Act, making the draft legal in the United States. Called up in the service in 1942 at the age of 21, Benny was shipped off for training to Camp Campbell, later renamed Fort Campbell, which was positioned right on the Tennessee Kentucky border. Camp Campbell was a brand new Army training camp whose construction was hastened after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Camp Campbell was to provide a training and mobilization base for a new type of Army organization, the Armored Division. Betty had been assigned to the 12th Armored Division, 493rd Armored Field Artillery Battalion, Headquarters Battery. The 12th Armored began its training here in September 1942 under the command of Major General Carlos Brewer. The 12th, also known as the Hellcats, would be a division credited with the capture of over 70,000 enemy troops during World War II. Benny would soon make his mark in Hellcat history. Soldiers assigned to the new division at Camp Campbell took physical and aptitude tests, and then they were assigned jobs such as tank or truck drivers, mechanics, cooks, and riflemen. Endless road marches were the order of the day to help keep the men in shape. First echelon maintenance was a favorite expression. Men's frustrations could be released in the dark. Toilet paper was thrown, bouncing off the heads of the officers sitting in the front rows in the theater. The 12th stayed at Camp Barkley for eight months before getting their orders to head overseas and fight. Hopping on a train and heading east, Benny was off to Camp Shanks, New York, also known as Last Stop USA. Here was the staging area and the final stateside stop for hundreds of thousands of U.S. troops shipping off to the war. September 20th, 1944, the same day his first son Roger was born, Benny and the Hellcats set sail aboard the USS Bliss along the North Atlantic under the command of Major General Robert Allen. On direct orders, they had to wear their life preservers at all times in case of a submarine attack. Not exactly a typical ocean cruise. Benny first touched foreign soil on Sunday, October 2nd, 1944, at Liverpool. From there, the division proceeded to Tidworth Barracks at Wiltshire. Getting used to the cold, rain, and mud in Europe was the first thing Benny had to prevail over in the fall of 1944. Packed six tight, the troops lodged in small pyramid tents. It was at Tidworth that they first learned the things like body bottom. Life sure was about to be different for Benny. After five weeks in Tidworth, the 12th crossed the English Channel, landed in France, and went out to assembly near Pape, France. Moving across France, the Hellcats paused at Louisville. The 493rd Armored Field Artillery Battalion fired the first combat round on December 5th, 1944, in Holmesburg. Fired at constantly by the German 88s, the 493rd didn't back down. It would be the first of many victories for Benny, his battalion, and for America. It was a brutal winter in France. Things like trench foot put more men out of action than enemy bullets did. Braving the cold winds and the snow proved difficult. 
493rd entered Germany for the first time on December 24th, 1944. No turning back now, they were on the hunt. On the day after Christmas, the Hellcats ate turkey and opened packages from home. It was the little things they'd say. The thought of going home to family, maybe laughing over a cartoon of Willie and Joe and the Stars and Stripes, or airdrops and D-bars. In such misery and hell, it was the little things they'd say. The new year, 1945, produced the bloodiest chapter in the false combat history. The hair of shine France, bloody hair of shine, as it was known, the Hellcast made a terrific price in combat. The 12th was pitted against the Jews. Captain got the credit, the Hellcats did the work. As it is, he going to spearhead for them, and, uh, and they, 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 get, they get the better stars. And we didn't. They were called the Mystery Division because Betty and his comrades had to take all the insignia <coughs> off their pants so the Germans didn't know what to do with their sister. Patton really admitted that it was, the, it was the best thing that ever happened. He said, opened up the uh, all the troops in northern, in the northern. Across the name from Wurzburg, the four red hot lads, purple Wilmer King, PFC's Benny Archibald, Bill Hare, Kirk Lewis, and the team rode over the crest of the hill in front of the battery to investigate a reportedly abandoned Wilmark motorcycle on side side. When about 200 yards from the accursed thing, their hearts had sunk, for the figures of three other GIs were seen around the bike. Fifty yards further, the peak jerked to a sudden stop, for the three figures resolved into three jerks, two with burp guns and one with the easily recognized Panzerfoss.